Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today we have a review of chapter 1003, and this week we are continuing our grand action piece on the rooftop of Onigashima, except this time around we are being hit with some very intriguing informations from the lower levels, courtesy of a perpetually mysterious group that we haven't seen since Act 1 of Wano. However, since CP0 are essentially a band of top secret manga spies, it makes a lot of sense to have kept their presence hidden from us. Hmm. What makes very little sense whatsoever though, is the idea of you not subscribing to the Grand Line review, which would result in a consistent injection of One Piece culture straight into your YouTube feed. It's a decision so mind boggling that look, you've confused poor Kaido here. So for the sake of moving the series forward, please do hit the button and unconfuse this manfish. But speaking of, this is another chapter that picks up right where the last one left off, which sounds like a really obvious and unnecessary thing to say. I mean, it's a linear story after all, but it's actually super rare to have three chapters in a row that pretty much function as back-to-back -back installments. Usually there's a little time jump or a location jump or something along those lines, but these three chapters can essentially be read as just like one long chapter. But here we are being treated to a much needed scene of Luffy, I suppose, utterly decimating Kaido. This is definitely the most real damage we've seen the Dragon Man take to date, especially that wonderful final punch, which looks like Luffy's putting his all into, resulting in Kaido's face, once again, being smacked down into the delicious dirt below. I mean, really, that dirt must have been pretty gourmet tasty considering that Kaido has now gone back down for seconds. Meanwhile, there is this very tiny yet noteworthy panel of used to skid at this point, watching Luffy seemingly astonished. And to be fair, this would be the first time that he's truly seen Luffy in action. And I do think it's a bit of a stark realization to Kid that he just does not possess anywhere near that kind of raw power that Luffy is capable of. The look on his face actually seems very humbling because he knows that he's just, you know, not capable of generating the same sort of results. Of course, that's because Kid has a lot less risk involved in using his abilities. And during this chapter, we have some pretty big alarm bells ringing as Gear Fourth inevitably runs out and Luffy is forced to revert to his Hocula state for 10 whole minute things. Oh no, oh no, it's Stress Rosa time again. Ah. 10 minutes is an awfully long time. I think we all remember how crucial and painfully long those minutes were during Dressrosa. And there, there was a threat of significantly less value. All we had to deal with was like a bird cage and this wildly flamboyant man. That was it. Things are gonna be just a little bit more difficult against two of the four emperors, but I'm actually quite excited about this development, mainly because this is an opportunity to see the other members of the worst generation really step up and shine. Because let's be real, these guys, yeah, they're all pretty sugoi in their own right. But whenever Luffy is with them, well, he just naturally steals the focus. I mean, look at him, charming, smiling fuck. But in the end, this scene also quite blatantly emphasizes an important ongoing theme of the series in general, which is that Luffy would be nothing, absolutely nothing without his allies. Yeah, amongst everyone, he packs the most punch power, but those punches never actually reach their target without the help of usually uh, literally everyone. Not just the Straw Hats, not just their direct allies, but even the tertiary island citizens usually jump in. It's like, you know, the metaphor to stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, Luffy is more like a giant standing on the shoulders of regular people, a critical mass of regular people that lift him to victory. And I think that will only become more obvious in the coming chapters. He's also a complete derp. I mean, look at him. His tongue is always out going on. It's like my dog. This isn't even the first time I've compared Luffy to my dog. Not even the first time this week, actually. With Luffy now temporarily out of the action though, the other four worst generation members are, well, I guess they're doing what they can. And I'd like to extend a formal congratulations to Trafalgar Law at the very least for being the first one to land what looks like some sort of convincing hit on Big Mom. She was struck with a counter shock, which is one of those strange law techniques that works because of reasons. Interestingly enough though, counter shock was first used in chapter 667, the end of which was when Law proposed an alliance with Luffy, stating that he had a plan to take down one of the four emperors. And while that was a disingenuous lie at the time, here we are now doing the thing. And the use of counter shock is a very nice and incredibly subtle callback to the birth of this alliance. Although at this point, I really do think that we should change Law's title from pirate captain to something more representative and realistic, something like, you know, Luffy's overly grumpy babysitter. And speaking of babysitting, thank you past me for that kind segue. Zoro is another figure of interest here as always. And at this point he has begun quite literally carrying this team, lifting Luffy out of harm's way like the good green haired lad he is. But in 1003, Zoro also uses my all time favorite attack of his being a souped up Tatsumaki, deciding to go with the intriguing strategy of fighting one tornado with another tornado, which to be fair, yeah, worked out pretty well. And Zoro got in quite a decent 
amount of damage with various individuals and by various, I mean two, but they noticed that Zoro was able to slice a nice cutto in Kaido. With that said, I'm assuming at this point that Enma is the only sword actually capable of doing that. There is only a single slice mark, which for three swords is like a 66.6% .6 miss rate. Bad swordsman. Bad. But until proven otherwise, against Kaido, Zoro only really has one decent weapon to work with, which is pretty bad because if said weapon were to be taken away from him, then well, oh no. However, this does conjure at least one intriguing thought, being that Kozuki Odin was able to unleash this redonk haki in both of his blades, resulting in Kaido's trademark cross scar. So what if over the course of this battle, Zoro learns to do just that with his other two swords, and he is able to one-up the situation by reopening Odin's wound, but leaving three scars instead of two. Admittedly, yes, that is probably just the wild Zoro fanboy running around there, but I do wonder if Zoro will innately learn advanced armament hockey purely through its use with Enma. I don't know, so we shall see. But skipping ahead to the cliffhanger of this week involving Sir Kaido, we have something that I did not expect. This is something I did not expect. See, there's proof of me not expecting it. But in a series of two panels, we become aware that Kaido has entered his hybrid form. And this is huge, much, much more so than it seems. I mean, firstly, yes, we've not seen this part of Kaido, so that's great, thumbs up there. But more so than that, this is actually the first time that we've seen the hybrid form of any mythical Zoan user. Which to recap, our other four would be Marco, Sengoku, Katarina Devon, and Orochi, the latter of which is actually relevant in this chapter, but not right now because I am talking about dragons. The reason why I bring this up though is because for quite a long time, there has been a very popular theory that perhaps mythical Zoans don't have hybrid forms at all because they're such super special magical creatures that just exist outside of the standard Zoan rules. And to be fair to that theory, the strange sort of powers that we've seen thus far did make that quite plausible, especially with someone like Marco. So I'm very happy that we have that confirmation under our belts and wildly excited to see this new and kind of unexpected form of Kaido. I think it definitely shows that we're entering a new phase of this fight, very boss battle-like, and it's also very telling that we did not see Kaido use this form against the vassals. I mean, kind of depressing in retrospect, but I suppose he just didn't see them as worthy challenges. It actually boggles my mind a bit to think that Kaido is deliberately handicapping himself by using the pure dragon form, which is already wildly overpowered. But in the grand scheme of things, that's just Kaido's Charmander, man. What we're seeing here in this silhouette is like a fully fledged Charizard, except that the Charizard in this case is a fish. Oh, and a quick note on Kaido's fish, this is kind of crazy, but just in case you haven't heard, in the SBS segments of Volume 98, Oda actually revealed the full name of Kaido's devil fruit. It's called the Ua Unami model Seryu, which I believe is one of Japan's four mythical guardians. Seryu guarding the east while Suzuku does the south. Something I only know because I watched Fushigi Yugi when I was a young lad. And if you'd like to know more about this, then please do check out my video covering that, as well as a whole ton of other amazing information revealed in that particular SBS. Onwards with the chapter though, and weirdly enough, my favorite part of this wasn't the epic battles taking taking place on the roof, but instead the uh, three dude bros just casually talking inside of Onigashima, obviously representing CP0. And what I really loved about this section was using Go as a framing device. And this is because there are times when these large arcs can get a bit repetitive and weird in One Piece. And when it comes to dishing out information, it usually consists of straight dialogue with one person sort of yeah, 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 yammering out the current state of affairs. But I think that Oda is well aware of the fact that there are just so many forces at play on Wano that it is getting confusing and a bit impossible to keep track of. So what he's done here is perfectly simplify the status of the raid through a go board. Oh, this is perfect. For the first time in this entire raid, I actually feel like I kind of perfectly understand what's happening. And Go was a fantastic choice because I know that the temptation for a scene like this in the Western world would be to use chess. But chess can be confusing for non-players as well who don't understand what value the pieces have or even what they're called. But on a Go board, everything is beautifully simplified into black circles and white circles. Nothing more, nothing less. And from this, we can tell that right now there are more black circles than white circles. So we are in a bad situation. Having infiltrated Onigashima, but being surrounded on all sides. I love it, it is masterfully done. The other thing this section does is bring renewed focus onto the lower levels. The main CP0 agent puts an exceptional amount of focus onto the Toby Ropo, the lead performers, these figures that we've kind of brushed aside for the last four chapters or so. So it's a good transition back into that idea of, oh man, we have a lot to accomplish here before we can even consider taking down Kaido or Big Mom. It's also just nice to have confirmation that CP0 
Zero are still on Wano. Very notably, none of these three agents were present at the Reverie. I mean, there is one guy who does look kind of similar, but they are different agents. And so I'm infinitely intrigued by them because I really don't think that any of these three are former members of CP9. So they're just this mysterious band of completely untapped potential, and it does set up a very maybe potential conflict with one Diaz Drake, a prominent member of S.W.O.R.D., AKA the anti-CP0 squad. Although right now these guys seem pretty content to just, you know, chill and watch two pirate factions rip each other apart, which yes, I can get on board with that. But in the past, I've also seen so many people doubt that Luffy or anyone will see their bounties raised after Wano because it's an isolated country and in theory, no one would know what happened. And while I've always maintained that, you know, the defeat of two of the four emperors probably wasn't going to remain secret, it now does doesn't matter because CP0 are our key link to the world government. They are here and they know pretty much everything, just like Stussy on Hawkeye Island. But in other news, CP0 also seem to kind of confirm Orochi's death as well, which is, I don't know, maybe that's pretty big. We've seen his head again, which has not moved and still looks equally as dead. Although I'm beginning to think that this particular head might be a bit of a red herring. No, I refuse to believe that one man with eight heads can lose one of said heads and be considered dead because basic mathematics tells me that seven heads still remain somewhere. You're not fooling me, Orochi. The idea being that, sure, the head we're seeing is dead. However, the other seven could sprout out of Orochi's body, which we have not seen since the decapitry incident. Although I have to say, if Orochi really is dead, then I well and truly stand by placing him so, so high on my worst Devil Fruit users list. What a complete Orochi of a Devil Fruit that is. And just as a general note, this chapter does feel a bit short, at least to me, but that's clearly because of the four double page spreads, all of which are heavily focused on action. Pages like that make it really easy to get swept away by momentum and just blast straight through them. Still, a very solid chapter overall though. A great continued escalation of Act 3 and one that makes me wonder really where we're going from here. We've already had one round of Luffy throwing the big guns at Kaido using his new armament skills and I wonder how deep this well goes. Outside of, you know, bigger punches and Snake Man, I suppose, does Luffy have more surprises in store for us? I'd say almost certainly, but if you want to explore that a bit more, then please do check out this video where Oda drops some key information regarding a potential Gear 5th form. And I look forward to seeing you there.